classes in polymer dynamics based on George Philly's book Phenomenology of Polymer Solution Dynamics Cambridge University Press 2011 and today this lecture is Lecture 2 Design Elements in Puerto Rico in any event, this is course IMGD 2500, Design of Tabletop Strategy Games. I'm Professor Phillies. This is Lecture 2. What I am going to be doing today is to be discussing the game you are going to be playing in lab tomorrow, which is Puerto Rico. Now, the, there's a point of playing, doing, playing these games and the point of playing the games is that you're learning how to do playtesting, you're learning how to analyze a game, you're learning what is going on when a game designer has created something that actually works. The point is not to win the game. Uh, the lab will run, and the instruction, if you work through things, is that you're going to play the game twice. You're going to play the game once with the rules as written, and then you are going to play the game again with a rule that had to be fixed before it was a good game. And one of the things you want to do is to see why the alternative rule made it a bad game. Or at least not as good a game. Now when you test the alternative rule you should realize that all of these rules fit together. And if you change one rule and don't think about changing other rules to match, you will get a game that is terrible, not because the one rule you changed is bad, but because you didn't make things fit together. In particular, the recommendation and instruction, when you change the rule, you have to get rid of the rule that objects in storage, like barrels of coffee or whatever, vanish all the time at the end of a round, because if you do that, the game won't work at all. Okay. So we are going to talk about Puerto Rico, and I am going to talk about examples of the descriptors that can be applied to it, and in future lectures we will be talking about what each of those descriptors is. So first of all, we have this object. It's a board game. There are other sorts of games that are not board games, and we'll get to some of them. It's many of Some of them are played on tabletops, some aren't. We could also talk about, in addition to the physical realization, we can talk about the shape of the game. Shape is a phrasing I lifted from the theory of strategic play in Go. Shape and outward influence, there are several others, are strategic factors in identifying when a play is good. However, what I mean by shape here is that the shape of a game is the space that it occupies in the life of the players. So what can we say about the shape of Puerto Rico? Well, it's for three and a half, three to five players. Play runs about 15 rounds. It's, it's more or less close-ended. Um, there are a number of rules going on, and it would be almost impossible to play the game for an arbitrary number of cycles. You'd hit one of the closing conditions. The game under normal conditions runs an hour and a half, a couple of hours. Uh, the game is tactically rich. It has a certain number of relatively simple rules, and part of the tactical richness is that on top of the simple rules, there are complications. Can we contrast this? Well, yes. Um, uh, scissors, rock, paper. It's a two-player game. It lasts no time worth mentioning. At the other extreme, we have something like Campaign for North Africa or Division-Level Advanced Squad Leader. We'll get to that in a bit. Suffice to say that you can get games that are different sizes and occupy different amounts of player effort. The game has a theme. And you have the pretty picture, and if you look hard, there are sailing ships, and there is a drawing of Puerto Rico, and there are references in the game to colonial economics. And there is an important lesson to be learned here by, remember, this is a German game. 
there, uh, Germany never had colonies in the Americas. And as a result, some German thinking about what North America is like or was like in the past is sometimes a bit innocent. Uh, the, however, someone finally pointed out what the theme was, and it then entirely justly became extremely controversial. And to explain what the theme is, I will start with the question, have any of you ever been involved in harvesting sugar cane? Statistically unlikely. Have any of you ever been hired on to do agricultural harvesting at all? Also statistically unlikely. Okay. Sugarcane grows in these big stalks, and you have to go in, and in this period there were essentially no machines. You had to go in and cut it down basically with a machete and haul it off, and you did various things to extract the parts. Sugarcane spines are sharp. Sugarcane harvesting, remember we're in the tropics. We're doing this in late summer. It is the most brutally physical sort of effort you can imagine. The Spanish, this is Puerto Rico, did it with slave labor. And first they kidnapped all of the Carib Indians. This is a group that basically doesn't exist anymore. And impressed them. And when they ran out of Carib Indians, they began hauling people from Africa. Sugarcane harvesting and what is associated with it is so brutal that the slave populations died off and had to be regularly replaced. And so, as the critics of Puerto Rico pointed out, basically you are having players who are entertaining themselves on the basis of some of the most horrible slave labor known to man. That's real politics. And sometimes you should try to be sensitive to these things when you choose your game design or you will come up with something as appalling as Custer's Revenge. You can look up Custer's Revenge for yourself and why it was, <clears throat> to put it extremely mildly, politically incorrect. Okay, well having said that, there's a theme, uh, but you're really at the top end of things and you don't see the bottom end. There's also a style of play. Puerto Rico is a progress game. The game lasts the same number of turns, basically, for everyone. And at the at game's end, you ask, what did you accomplish with this bit of your life? That is, there is a computation of victory conditions. It's not like a racing game, say a yacht racing game or a horse racing game, where the objective is to be the first person across the finish line. In Puerto Rico, the objective is, what did you do before the game ran out of steam? Because there's a victory point calculation. That makes it a progress game. And then at the bottom, there are the game mechanics. Um, if we look at this, at the top end, we're saying we're creating a machine or a computer program. And it has some description. And it has some things that in general say what it does, and it has details of what it does. And then way down at the bottom, there are the gears and cams and come from instructions in the software. And you combine all these and you get results. But down at the bottom, there are the mechanisms you put in the game to have the game work. Mechanisms can be shared between yeah. games. If you write an optimal sorting program, it doesn't matter what you're sorting. Optimal sort generally works the same way. If you're designing a machine, um, well, there are very good reasons why you do not put in large amounts of high to, speed, high to low speed reduction if you can avoid it, because there are energy losses if you're designing something with gears. And I could go on. There are mechanics. And they all have uses. And mechanics are the basic things, or one of the basic things, you assemble to put the game together. Um, on top of the me mechanics, there is the artwork. There is some artwork. There are the theme and the thematic elements 
Um, the thematic elements are, well, we start with the funny typeface. We start with the gentleman on the box side. We start with the unit counters, such as they are. And those are things that are not the same as mechanics. They're things that make the game appealing. If instead of saying you had coffee, sugar, indigo, I said you had raw materials one, two, three, uh, the strategy might be identical, but it might not sound as interesting. If you read science fiction games, there is this tendency to replace steel, titanium transistors with unknown element one, unknown element two, unknown element three, and guess what? You're losing things when you do that. Okay, so what are the sorts of game mechanics we put in and did not put in? Well, first of all, there, let's start with a simple question. How many of you actually have played or sort of think you understand how to play the game? Hands. Okay. The rest of you should correct this deficiency before lab tomorrow. So you come in and you've tried to play it, and you, th and you should all think you know what the rules are, and then you will sit down and play the game for a few turns, explaining out loud what you're doing and what rules you're following, and that will give you some impression of what is going on in the game. Okay. Having said that, when you start playing the game, you'll discover there's actually extremely little player interaction. Players can't trade with each other. Uh, players can't do very much to interfere with what each other is doing. There's very, it's not zero interaction because of the role, role feature, but it's very limited. This is a business game with production elements. And I think I'm going to put a few of these things on the board so you keep track. There was the physical realization, the fact that this is a board game. There is the shape, the space the game occupies in people's life. There is the theme, which got extremely controversial in Germany. Uh, for all, many Germans are unaware of North America. They tend to get quite excited about these things in some cases very correctly, there is what we would call the style of play, and then there are mechanisms. And if you look at the rules and take it apart, you will see here is a rule, there is a rule, and yes, the specific rule is, for example, I can trade three sugar for an indigo. That is not an actual game rule. The general notion is there is some mechanism for trade. The mechanism may um, be something that um, is specific in the rules. It may involve trade between players or trade with some central repository, the bank as it is sometimes called. But trade, being allowed to make exchanges, is a general mechanism. So I was listing mechanisms and one was no player interaction. And another is that this is a business game. And there are production elements. Now, some of the production elements are actually illusory. That is, if you have worked through the rules, you discover you have to have farms. They're actually called plantations. And the farms produce goods that are sent through factories, loosely speaking. So you have a farm that grows coffee beans, and you have a roaster that roasts the beans. And in the end, you end up with a barrel of coffee. However, if you read the rule carefully, you discover you have this item and you have that item. And if you have both of them, you start making coffee, but it's not that you have a farm and people on the farm, and you have some object that you have to physically ship from the farm to the roaster, and the roaster could even be owned by some other player. No, it's, there is a production unit that actually looks like this that produces the coffee. And that is sort of one level production. 
That is, you have something that sits there and makes objects. And then you have fragments of other level production. That is, somehow the coffee gets turned into money, doubloons, and the money can be used to buy buildings, for example. And the buildings get you victory points. Alternatively, you can take the coffee and you can do things with it and you can turn it into victory points directly. So, you have, this, you have pieces of economics, but if you ask, is this a representation of a complete economic system? Does this look like Sim Puerto Rico, where you can actually see all of the parts moving? Or at least sort of see them moving? The answer is, well, not really. You also have roles. Now, when we say roles, I do not mean role-playing games like Champions or Dungeons and Dragons. I mean, it was very clever when my good friend, the late Gary Gygax, somewhat accidentally invented Dungeons and Dragons with, along with Tim Arneson. Um, however, it was something of an accident, not a plan. Um, but what we're talking about here is very different. Now, the issue of roles, if you have a role-playing game, is that you are going to become the Fortran Hacker Supreme, or the fellow in the power armor, or the young lady in spandex who can shatter planets by looking at them. And the limitation on this, if you say we're going to create roles and each player takes a role, is that you have to balance them or you have to realize that the roles aren't balanced and players are going to gravitate towards one role. There are also board games with roles. For example, Talisman or Tales of the Arabian Nights. And roles can be much less prominent than they are in, say, Champions or Dungeons and Dragons. Here we have roles, but what the role is is something the character is allowed, the player gets to do, and the role does not become to the player. Instead, in a given round, if I move first and I choose um, captain, yes, I'm the captain, but everyone gets to take an action of some sort during the captain phase. Or if I am the builder, I choose the card, but then the action goes around the table and everyone gets to build. Um, so there is there are roles, but there have been a bunch of things done to balance the roles completely so it is not whoever gets here first and has a few thugs on hand proclaims him El Supremo, the mayor, and gets to keep all the tax money. Instead, things have been uniformitized. <coughs> Pardon me. Okay, other features of a game, mechanics. Physical appearance is not exactly a mechanic. Physical appearance is something that ties in with theme. You're selling the game, and yes, there are people who would be perfectly happy to play a completely abstract game, but you should realize there are other people, particularly <coughs> younger ones, who, while they're playing the game, are imagining they're really pirates or astronauts or investment bankers or whatever. And having a physical appearance and parts and references that fit in with this enhances the interest in playing the game. Okay. Oh yes. I'm running out of space here. There is an abstract map. In fact, you might say it's not really a map. It's a recording device. Assuredly, cities in Puerto Rico are not squares. If you put down buildings in any real city, that you do not put them down corner to corner, because if you do, no one can move around. Um, well, you might within a block. 
And if you have complete idiots, God knows what will happen. Mm -hmm. um, however, it's an abstract map. Now, if you hunt around on the internet, you can find someone who redid the Puerto Rico charts, the, the charts that pull out. And what they did is to say, well, we have a chart. It's very pretty. It looks like this. But I'm going to take the map, and I'm going to redo it completely so it looks like a pretty map. And instead of your farms being all in squares, they're spread out. And instead of your buildings being cheek to jowl, they sit on streets, and it looks much prettier. It's exactly the same game. We haven't changed anything in the rules. We've just changed what the game looks like. But that is the sort of change you can use to sell things. Oh, yes, I said there those... I guess we have something else, which I sort of mentioned. We have a method of recording scores and resources. Recording in paper games is a challenge. Uh, one of you brought up the issue of, I, I believe it was said to be Europa Universalis, where there are so many things being kept track of, and the numerical values perform so many actions, that computer support, or a complete computer game, becomes useful so that people who do not love accounting can play it. Of course, the people who love accounting don't like this. It's sort of like having a game in which you have cards. We'll get to this one next week. And should the cards be visible on the, the table? And should the cards that have been played be visible on the player? And all of the bridge fanatics say, no, no, we hide all of the cards and we turn this into a short-term memory game. I am not fond of short-term memory games. Um, so that is recording. Uh, we do not have a full economy with markets, but we do have economic development. And so, as you buy buildings, as you buy things that sit on the table, some of those buildings have properties. So, for example, I have the right building, and if, I can, if someone does something and I construct another building, I automatically get a colonist for it. And there are a whole variety of these arrangements, and you therefore have economic development, so that if you buy the right objects, you are advantaged relative to the people who did not buy them, unless they bought something else, of course. Okay, what else do we have? Limited actions. By limited actions, I mean there are a whole lot of things you can do under the rules as a, under the rules as a player. Well, you are allowed to do any of them, but you can't do all of them. You can only do a few of them, and you have to choose which ones you can do. This is a common theme in a large number of games. For example, in some military games, you have some variation of command points. You're the commanding officer, but you can only give a certain number of orders of a certain complexity in a given turn. And therefore, because you have this limit on what you can do, the game becomes tactically richer because you have to choose. An extreme form of this, not one I approve of, is real-time simulation where the players who are faster with the joystick get more things done, and those of us who are trying to talk into it and notice it isn't working or responding to voice commands get less done in the same time. Um, limited actions are a feature. It's a standard feature of many games. Simple example, chess. In chess, you move and you get to move one piece at a time. An alternative to that would be you get, you're the white player and you get to move all of the white pieces. 
And then it's the other side's turn, and he gets to move all of the black pieces. Um, there was a set of miniatures rules called column line, we renamed it column line and gatling gun, because once combat started, both sides were wiped out very quickly. The chess game I just described would be the, about the same way. Namely, after a very tiny number of turns, there would be no pieces left on the board. Um, well, limited actions is what makes the game interesting. Okay. Oh, yes. Let me clear these out of the way. <coughs> We're talking about mechanisms. We're going to talk in future lectures about other things like different physical realizations. However, for tomorrow, you're going to be playing this game, and one thing you should do is to ask yourself, how many mechanisms, broadly speaking, can I, identi I identify? If you read the Design Elements book, uh, Chapter 3 lists a whole bunch of different mechanisms of play. Uh, my thinking on this has evolved a bit since Tom Vasil and I wrote the book. If I were to write another book, which I may do on the same topic, it would be a somewhat broader book in terms of these different levels of how we break a game's features up. But you should ask yourself, what are the mechanisms? And it's useful, and this is what we put into design elements, if you have a mechanism such as limited actions, you can go to the back and there is a, an index of all of the game, a bunch of games with limited actions. And in between, there's a whole very long chapter of board games and the particular, using the index, you can find all these board games that also use something that is limited action. Except some limited actions are very different from others, but they're all limited actions. Um, Puerto Rico also has a feature which is called, this is the name, rules breaking. Well, rules breaking is something of an imprecise name. Yeah, they're game rules. You can read them. These things that are, act, are being called rules breaking are also rules. They're not really rules breaking at all. They're exceptions. I will take, well, let's do the hands. How many of you know how to play chess hands? Well, most of you do. Okay. And maybe so the rest of, some of the rest of you know how to play checkers, which is good enough. Well, the notion in these games is you have a grid, and you have a unit, and the unit, this is a queen, can move from square to square and in a straight line. And the directions the unit can move and the distance the unit can move depend on which piece it is. And if there's a piece in the way, here's a pawn of the same color, the queen can't go that way because she can't go through. And so if the queen is surrounded by pawns, this would be a little tricky to do in a real game. She's trapped. But there's an exception. The knight does not move from square to square. She leaps and not in a straight line either, she moves like this. And intervening pieces do not stop knight moves the way they stop moves of other pieces. That's an exception. In Puerto Rico, the exceptions, if you're playing a role, are called privileges. So that if I, for example, choose the builder, we all go around and get to build something, but because I chose Builder, I get the advantage the Builder has, whatever it, it, the advantage is. Ditto for each of the other roles. 
And as a result, instead of saying, okay, we're all going to build something, it's yes, we're all going to build something, but because I chose builder, I can do this extra thing too. So that is privileges, and the notion of privileges is we have made the rules more complicated. We have these very simple rules, and they really are quite simple. But because there are exceptions to the rules, the game becomes tactically richer, and you get these fairly modest advantages. Similarly, if I um, perform, if it is time to do trading, and someone has chosen captain, if I have bought a wharf. I get these extra features that the rest of the players do not, because I own a wharf. Okay, so that's rules breaking. Another mechanism, that's actually a different mechanism, is limited resources. Uh, limited actions are an example of limited resources, but there are others. If you are playing one of these computer expand, explore, etc. games, well, it would be really nice to feel the fleet of a trillion super dreadnoughts, but if your mineral production only lets you build a frigate every other turn, you'd better focus on the fact but telling the computer, build a trillion super dreadnoughts means nothing will happen for a very long number of turns. Um, this is limited resources. Limited resources, limited actions are the example, are a path to forcing you to make choices. And one of the features of games like Puerto Rico is yes, resources are limited, you only are able to you assemble labor and whatever, and that's hidden from the actual explicit game, to put up one building a turn. You can't say, I have a ton of gold pieces, I'm going to build all 12 buildings this turn. Similarly, in Puerto Rico, you have a limited supply of colonists, you have a limited supply of each of the other counters, um, some of the limits are a little odd. For example, if we are all growing coffee, the fact that you have brought in a large coffee crop does not, and exhausted the coffee counters, does not mean that my coffee plants do not yield. They yield just fine. Unfortunately, it means, you do not see this in Puerto Rico, that the price of coffee crashes. And this the real market does not work quite the same way the game market does. Why do we have limited resources like this? Well, first of all, if we didn't have limited resources in some way, there is a tendency to run into something called exponential growth. And in exponential growth, we can grow 10 coffee this turn, and 15 next turn, and 23 the turn after, and 40 the turn after that. And the numbers get very large very quickly. And if you're using little wooden objects to represent them, you don't need a box. You need the object that is coming up the elevator and going to be moved here with the forklift. <laughs> well, that doesn't really yield an interesting game, unless you love accounting. And so you put in these limits, and you somehow stop exponential growth. That's limited resources. OK, so I have described a whole bunch of mechanisms of Puerto Rico. Let us now look, I think I can draw this picture right, a little more carefully at how we balance roles and what the original problem with the game was. The game was developed by this very clever German gentleman, but he describes hither and thither, if you read enough autobiographic statements, that he had most of the game done, and it was a really lousy game. Well, it wasn't that bad a game, probably. And he kept sitting, trying to figure out how to fix it. And the required fix 
was to change how the roles work, and the change was actually very small. Um, so let me first describe how roles work in the game, since a bunch of you don't know the rules yet. There are a series of, ro of roles like builder, captain, prospector. I'm not going to run through the whole list, which I probably would get wrong from memory. And each of these correspond to a little cardboard piece. And the cardboard pieces are set out, and there are a group of us playing. That's a group of us. And play is such that at the moment, this person is the mayor, he gets to choose first. So what player A does is to choose a role, whichever role he wants, or she wants. And so he chooses role one and does whatever it is. There's an exception to that, too. And then the one role walks around the table until everyone's done it. Now, it's the next player's turn. And the next player chooses a role, but not the role that's already been used. And only one role, because it's a limited action. And so she chooses role two. And role two then walks around the table. Okay. And we repeat this until player E over here gets a choice, and she gets role, chooses role five, and it goes all the way around. Now, the, there are a couple of balance features here, the most important of which is if I chose a role, say builder, everyone gets to build at more or less the same time. Not quite at, at the same time, but almost. Then, when the next role is chosen, I, who was first as player A, am now last because role two marches around like this. So far, so good? Okay, now we have gone through a cycle of play, a turn, in Avalon Hill lingo, a complete turn, and now we are going to go to the next turn. And so we collect all the role cards and do something else I'll get to in a second. And now, the, mayoral, the little mayor chip moves from here to here. And the player who was number one, I think I pushed it around. Did I push it around backwards? No. Okay. And the player who was number two now gets to make the choice first as to which role she wants. And it moves all the way around. And he who was first to choose the first time, is now last to get the benefit. And let's see, this person gets to choose, and this person gets to choose, and this person gets to choose, and this person gets to choose. And he who was first only gets to make the fifth choice of which role was wanted. And therefore, the advantage of moving first, which is sometimes the advantage of moving last, gets smeared out because there's this complicated turn order. And so everyone gets every role, and everyone gets every opportunity to choose which role they want. In addition, you remember I said there was something else done when you collect all of these little cards. The little cards have roles labeled on them. So someplace in here, here is a roll, and there are a bunch of these. And so in addition to that, since only, there are only five players and there are more than five roles, some roles did not get selected at all. How do we even that out? Well, we take all of the roll cards that were not used during the turn and we put a gold doubloon on top of each of them. And if they're not called again, we put a second doubloon on. And if the players are really stubborn, the value of that unused card gets really big because it hasn't been used in a while. And sooner or later, someone figures out that grabbing a dozen doubloons is worth not doing anything else and grabs it. 
So that is role balancing. Now you don't have to do role balancing. The alternative to balancing roles is to say, I am going to write roles so they correspond to my idea of realism. And we see this in games like Dungeons and Dragons or Champions role playing games where you are going to play a character or a group of several characters. And if you read, I'm going to, how many of you play, have played Champions Hands? Mmm. It is a great game for numeric, careful numerical studies. How many of you have played Dungeons and Dragons? <laughs> Okay, we will use Dungeons and Dragons, which I played when it first came out. Uh, this was a while ago. Uh, and so you choose some role, cleric, magician, and the roles probably are not well balanced. And if you are playing champions with non it's a superhero game, you get to design your own superhero in great numerical detail. Spreadsheets are helpful. Uh, but if you do this, you eventually realize that the fellow who wrote the champion's rules, or so I am told, really thought that heroes in power armor are at the top, and we go downhill from there, and the rules are somewhat optimized towards heroes in power armor, and if you choose something else, this is disadvantageous, unless, of course, the games master fixes the rules to avoid this consequence. Okay, so I have described Puerto Rico, and I put this very complicated chart on the board. And now we come, we're approaching the end of class, now we come to the issue of why the Puerto Rico design hit a roadblock that had to be overcome. In the original rule, it was something, it's a very reasonable design idea if you haven't figured out the game completely. We have this set of roll cards, and we have the five players. And we start, and here's the mayor chick, so player one chooses roll A and uses it. Player two can only choose one of the remaining roles and chooses roll B. Player three can only choose one of the remaining roles and chooses roll C and roll D and roll E. Now that obviously plays very fast relative to if I choose the builder, everyone else gets to build. Because we go through a complete turn very fast. However, in general, you would like to do one thing, a second thing, and a third thing, not necessarily in the same order. And you have to wait until you have an opportunity to choose the right roll card, which can take a while before you can play the role. Uh, there are a number of other rules, if you read, think about this, there are a number of rules that make perfect sense for this very complicated play order where, for example, if I choose captain, everyone gets to load goods on a ship up to those constraints. Uh, well, if I choose captain and I am the only captain, and all of the other resources are taken off the board because I was captain, you will notice that it's the next player's turn to move. And they don't have anything. They don't have any coffee. They don't have any indico. They don't have much. They are sort of limited in what they can actually do. You have to fix those rules so the rules do not have stupid consequences. And I suggest a few fixes. But what you're going to do in lab tomorrow is play test this and see why it doesn't work well, so you see a contrast. You see a game that has really been play tested well and works well and was extremely popular, and a game with a, almost the same game, same counters, almost everything the same, with a clunky rule, which even if you smooth out the rough edges, there are some real rough edges if you don't smooth them out. It's obvious most might classes, years past, have all agreed, this game is not a lot of fun. This game is not interesting. This game is painful. Can we burn it? And the answer is no, you just play with the good rules. So having said this, there are <coughs> pardon me, a whole bunch of things you're going to do. 
In lab tomorrow, you are going to play Puerto Rico twice for about an hour each time, once with the good rule, you probably won't finish. And once with the bad rule, and you will be grateful you're only playing for an hour. And you will write up a discussion of how the two games worked, and what changed, and why it matters. And that will be the lab report, the details are in the syllabus, and that will be due Thursday. Uh, tomorrow I will give the next lecture. I will be talking about economic development games. I will be talking about levels of economics question. Um, in the syllabus it says that the lab report is due the next Monday. Oh, that's right. It's due Monday. We'll give you some extra days. Yes, it's due Monday. So you have time. And you will each owe a lab report, so I will get a whole pile of lab reports. And this will be quite uniformly true of lab. Uh, we are almost out of time. Are there any questions? Okay, hands if you have found a design group. Hands if you are still searching. <clears throat> okay, I see. Th actually saw four people since I missed one. We had one person who took the fifth. Maybe two people who took the fifth. Those of you who put the, your hands up just volunteer, can volunteer to be a design group. And if you find anyone else, that's good too. Um, in any event, you have found your design groups. You have given me the homework. I will try to have it back tomorrow. We are at an end of class. Dismissed. <laughs>